everybody, by the way, all the postdocs, uh, scholars, visiting scholars, and so forth. Yeah, just want to second that, and oh, this is on and live. Um, and thank you for coming today. It's always exciting to begin the year with such a big bang, and we're very excited about our speaker today. Uh, just want to give you a quick overview of the colloquium um, series all year. You probably have heard that uh, our theme this year will be race and anthropological interrogation. Uh, following on last year's theme, Extinction. Uh, and uh, what we want to do all year is uh, think about the massive historical transformations in thinking about people uh, over the modern era, primarily over the modern era, meaning um, you know, 15th, 16th century uh, forward. We also want to look at the links between anthropology and concepts of race over time, and therefore we want to elaborate a history of anthropology and a history of race uh, through the course of the year. Uh, as a modern concept, race inspired uh, the scaffolding of U.S. anthropology's four-fieldedness, with the Boasian differentiation of race from culture and language inaugurating a new approach to human pasts, presence, and potential futures and an approach that dismantled the evolutionary models that had shaped earlier anthropological notions of civilizational difference. Uh, we know that while race is a quintessentially modern category, it also has a prehistory, uh, one that might fruitfully be explored through archaeological and paleontolog uh, paleontological research. And more recent biological anthropological research has been at the forefront of debunking simplistic notions of how bodies, behavior, identity, and life chances are connected. So throughout this year, we will be interrogating the, rec the reckoning of categorical distinctions across the subfields, and we will explore the various effects of this reckoning on the production of both knowledge and politics. So we're really excited. We're even more excited that our first speaker who will be launching off this uh, series of uh, analyses is Dr. Lee Baker. Lee D. Baker, until recently Dean of Academic Affairs at the Trinity College of Arts and Sciences, Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, and Professor of Cultural Anthropology, Sociology, and African and African American Studies at Duke University. Uh, Dr. Baker received his B.S. from Portland State and his doctorate in anthropology up the road at Temple University, where he worked under the guidance <laughs> of uh, Tom Patterson. Lee became an assistant professor in, the cultural, in cultural anthropology at Duke in 1995, and he left for a few years to teach at Columbia from 97 to 2000, where not incidentally, he was on the committee of our illustrious John L. Jackson, Jr. <laughs> he returned to Duke in 2000, and since then, uh, he has held positions as he was a resident fellow at Harvard's W.B. E. Du Bois Institute, the Smithsonian's National, Natural Museum of National Museum of American History, uh, Johns Hopkins Institute for Global Studies, University of Ghana, the American Philosophical Society, and the National Humanities Center in North Carolina. His books include From Savage to Negro, Anthropology and the Construction of Race, 1896 to 1954, Life in America, Identity and Everyday Experience, and anthropology and the racial politics of culture. And through all of these texts, he's really been interested in exploring the role of anthropology in constructing and transforming popular notions of race and the intellectual ways that we have uh, understood and interrogated race as a concept, both, uh, you know, well, in, in the US context. So uh, finding ways to bring together analyses of African Americans. Uh, Native Americans, and as we will see in just a moment, immigrants, new, new Americans. Lee's primary research interests have had to do with how nation states that anchor their identity in a commitment to equality and justice can actually perpetuate inequality and injustice. And although his focus has been on the history of U.S. anthropology, he's also conducted research among indigenous populations in Australia, uh, he takes students every year to Ghana as well and has published articles on a wide range of subjects including sociolinguistics, race, and democracy. 
Baker has also been involved in the American Anthropological Association in a range of governance capacities, and he is the recipient of the Richard K. Loveland Distinguished Teaching Award, and he makes a fierce gumbo. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't also say that Lee has been a longtime friend and mentor, and that he has critically shaped the field of American anthropology, not only through his scholarship, but also through his teaching, his advice, and his example. Please join me in welcoming Lee D. Baker. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and really appreciate Madam Editor-in-Chief, <laughs> the invitation to come here to Penn, where we both compete for graduate students and undergraduate students every single day. No, we, you know, Penn is one of our, our true peers, and it's been great to be able to uh, communicate to this wonderful learning community. I mean, look at this group, how diverse, how interesting. It makes me feel wistful for a four-field department. Duke only has cultural anthropology, and you can really see the real benefit and value of having uh, four fields under one department. So diversity in all kinds of ways, including intellectual interests. What I love to do, and I sort of, you know, you can imagine staked my career early on. I actually have a letter from George Stockton that says, you know, you should really be, do ethnography if you want a job. Because <laughs> so I was like, this anthropology, this key stuff is really compelling. But what I wanted to do, and I've just sort of been so excited about because, well, maybe because not too many people do history of anthropology, and there's a lot of stories to be told, but to look at anthropology as a science as it, as it has shifted in response to culture and how anthropology as a science has sifted, shifted American culture. And it's this sort of interesting dialectic over the course of beginning in, you know, as a defense for slavery up until um, really a tool in the civil rights sort of activist arsenal to really push Brown v. Board of Education and the later civil rights movement. And anthropology as the science of race and culture has been part of the nation-making, race-making apparatus of America from the beginning in a way that it is more profound than psychology. Maybe not economics, but psychology is a pretty big field. But anthropology, in its relationship to public policy, popular culture, and the law, has a larger-than-life presence. It's, it's interesting, once anthropology no longer became a science, the impact of anthropology sort of waned. That could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing, because anthropology as a science has not always been standing up for social justice. It's actually been a tool for racial repression in, in many respects, and I'll go through some of those examples. But it's always had this sort of ambivalent relationships, and it's, it's not necessarily predictive in interesting sort of ways. The way anthropology gets appropriated by agents or people. And I'm going to give you a couple <coughs> brief examples to sort of set the approach I take towards doing the history of, of, of anthropology. In the 1890s, um, people were looking at African American culture as being denigrated and part of this savage, barbarian, civilized sort of arc of, of, of civilization. And they looked at the country folks, the poor blacks in their folklore, big well before Zorga folks. This is in the 1890s. Actually, Franz Boas was a big part of this looking at, trying to look at how this maps on to their racial evolution. But the early, we want to call them anthropologists, early intellectuals of Hampton Institute said, well, at least they're telling our stories. Let's go out there and collect this folklore, because it might disappear. And so they used anthropology to showcase how rich 
the folklore, the hoodoo, the, uh, the stories, the preaching, the, the, you know, the, the relationship between the church and secular healing, it was pretty amazing. So they sort of took anthropology and said, at least they can tell our stories in these journals and life. So it was used, it was upended by these African-American intellectuals, and some of them were white missionaries, to sort of upend and sort of tell the story in empowering ways. Great story. The other um, way of appropriating anthropology, the other way the anthropologists, particularly in the progressive era, were sort of used was through the um, very kind of conservative Native American movement that wanted to defend the use of peyote, really protect religions, and the like. And people think that that is progressive. You know, that was something good. The anthropologist James Mooney, for example, is a great example. And he was out there supporting traditional Native American dance and religious practices. But it becomes surreal when you have the Native Americans who were part of the progressive era, who wanted education, thought the Native Americans were blowing their brains out with peyote, because they were abusing how they abusing all, and the ghost dance was great, but we should actually get educated. This is the only way to make it in America. So you get these wild examples of James Moody going up in the Washington Post, right, against Atala Shah, who was a, basically a racial uplifter for Native Americans, but was really educated, had a whole American Indian movement behind her, telling her she was not authentic because the dress of that came from a Paiute and the, you know, I don't know what, her, her talk came from a different tribe. And the fact that she was blending different traditional customs, she, he said, was inauthentic, and that's why she should get off the stage. It was stunning. And so then anthropology became an unreliable narrator in this sort of movement to support American Indians because people saw that and they were just trying to keep the Native Americans down. They were trying to do the right thing, though, because to support. I mean, so much of my work shows like this ambivalence. It's like, yeah, they, they intended to do the right thing, even from a political standpoint we might share, but it ends up being problematic because you have other people trying to do other right things. And this sort of tension between the way anthropologists work is, is fascinating. Fast forward, 1954 was one of the great moments of American um, anthropology in its support of the Brown versus Board of Education. It's kind of ironic, in 1896, anthropology was used to bolster Plessy versus Ferguson and the savage barbarian civilized. Um, and quickly, you know, 50 years, some odd years later, anthropology was actually used in the testimony leading up, saying that African Americans are just like everyone else, should not be segregated. Some great quotes, um, some great activists. And then later, people like Margaret Mead, um, actually brought the entire American Association for the Advancement of Science together to have this statement on race that said, you know, there's no basis to um, segregate African Americans going up against people like Carlton Kuhn and others who were still holding on to ideas of, of racial difference. And there were some standouts, but she really brought things on. So it's an interesting history that, um, has important legacies. I've done a lot of work with Native Americans, African Americans, um, in, the, in the anthropology and the construction of race. And when the, the Tom was asking me to do this, I was thinking, what can I do? And I've been doing some current research on STEM education as dean. I was very involved in bringing critical race theory to a bunch of scientists that were well-meaning but didn't quite understand the relationship between the SAT scores and success. And I, I wrote a little bit about that. Um, but it was an excuse to bring me back to doing history of anthropology. But what I have not done is looked at immigrants. And Trump you know, has just been in my head the whole summer. <laughs> and it's like, you know, this kind of sounds familiar, but this rhetoric of anti-immigrant rhetoric is a deep well in American culture. I mean, it runs really deep. 
And much of the rhetoric is like virtually exactly the same. And to me, it was like, this is one area. I've done a little bit of it, but I never really dug in deep into this. So this is an opportunity. This is a brand new research. This is essentially I'm workshopping it. I'm about halfway done. So hopefully we can have a conversation of you know, what the direction is. I think I will telescope or telegraph where I'm going, and I can try to get to my conclusion in the, the Q&A. But this is sort of a first cut of um, a paper that I am calling Anthropology as the reliable, the unreliable narrator on race. It starts with an epigraph. The Hindu, from a historical, philo philo philological, and ethnological point of view, they're looking at the Hindu from a historical, philological, and ethnological point of view, there is no reasonable doubt about his identity as a white man. A little sunburn, it is true, but nevertheless, a white man. That was Thomas Manx in Begatsen Thin's brief in front of the Supreme Court, where he was trying to argue because he was Indian, he was white, a free white person to claim naturalization. That comes up. We'll see where I a little soundboard. In November of 1919, Benjamin Bledsoe, the right eminent grand commander of the Knights Templar of California, was the right eminent grand commander. Speaking at a conclave of knights, he extolled, the practical duty of the Knights Templar of today is to protect and defend at all hazards, organized government, the bulwark of our civilization. He explained, that radical socialism, Bolshevism, IWWism, and criminal syndicalism uh, must go, and it is the duty of every Knight Templar to stamp out un-Americanism wherever it is found. LA Times, 1919. Bledsoe also served as the United States District Judge for the Southern District of California. And in March of that year, he ruled in a precedent-setting immigration case that South Asians were white, explaining that, quote, modern ethnologists use the term white and Caucasian synonymously and interchangeably. <clears throat> Seemingly, the preponderance of respectable opinion, this is still the quote, respe respectable opinion includes the Hindus of India as members of the Aryan branch or stock of the so-called Caucasian or white race, Henry Mohan. To substantiate this claim, Judge Bledsoe simply but authoritatively cited, this was the one site in the court case, Report on the Immigration Commission, Senate Document Number 662, 61st Congress, Third Session. With a hint of incredi incredulity, he emphasized that Quote, no anthropological authority has ever included the Hindus in any other races of mankind, end of quote. Judge Bledsoe implied that he looked around and if any anthropologist had categorized South Asian Hindus, as he calls them, as any race other than Aryan, he would have used it. They didn't, so he didn't, so he couldn't. In the mind of Judge Bledsoe, the authority of anthropology was reliable and credible. He granted the application for citizenship to Mohan Singh because, according to science, he was a free white person. Nine years later, however, District Court, District Court Judge Borquin was reviewing an application for citizenship of Faraz Din, who was, quote, a typical Afghan. Ferris Din's application for citizenship was being adjudicated in the Northern District of California. Judge Borkwin was emphatic in his ruling that, quote, what ethnologists, anthropologists, and other so-called scientists may speculate and conjecture in respect to races and origins may interest the curious and convince the credulous, but it is of no help in arriving at the intent of Congress. When they pass that law, that only free white persons could become citizens in the intent of Congress when they passed that law. 
Nikhil Singh explains that the story of nationhood must be told over and over because there is nothing natural about the nation or fashioning of its predominant civic identities. Nations are made primarily through the techniques of narration and representation. During the first quarter of the 20th century, anthropology was a reliable narrator on race and the tangle of laws, policies, and court decisions that constituted immigration and naturalization law. There was considerable ambiguity and anxiety over who was white and how to maintain and reproduce an American nation that was racially and culturally homogeneous during the years leading up to the Johnson-Reed Act of 1924. That law institutionalized immigration quotas based on national origins, banned the immigration of people of Asian descent, severely curtailed immigration of African countries, and extended the strict rules for naturalization to all people immigrating to the US. Anthropology played key roles in validating who was and who was not white, white which was the central question of who could become a naturalized citizen of the United States and, su and subsequently even immigrate to the United States. There were, however, limits to anthropological authority. The 18th century language on whiteness that dominated naturalization law for nearly a century and a half was, stipu was stipulated clearly and succinctly in an act to establish an uniform rule of naturalization, or the Naturalization Act of 1790, which declared, quote, that any alien being a free white person who resided in a state for two years and of good character could become a citizen. In the wake of the Civil War, Congress ratified the 14th Amendment in 1868, which granted citizenship to the recently emancipated Negroes and provided birthright citizenship for all, save for untaxed Indians. I don't quite know what that is, but that's in the law. Congress quickly followed with an updated and updated the Natural Act the Naturalization Act of 1870, clarifying, quote, that the naturalization laws are hereby extended to aliens of African, African nativity and to persons of African descent. Leaving, and this is important, leaving unchanged the language of 1790 regarding free white person. Douglas Coulson explains that, quote, from 1870 to 1940, to be eligible for naturalization, a person had to be either white or African but the racial eligibility of Asian petitioners remain disputed. Like all racial categories, it's difficult to sort people into discrete buckets, particularly when religion, geopolitics, language, and a desire or an aversion to assimilate are thrown into the mix. Identifying how anthropology was and was not used as an authoritative epistemology in the construction of race during the progressive era and interwar years is an instructive way of identifying the limits of anthropology, mapping how and when the discipline contributed to society and was viewed as a relevant science or not in those critical years of nation making and enables us to better delineate the role anthropology played in the construction of race, specifically the capacious expansion of what it meant to be white. At the end of the day, anthropology was used as one of several authoritative discourses to delineate who was white and who was not white during a period of American history where people who were not quite white were suspected of changing the blood and character of the nation by putatively taking jobs of real Americans, contributing to a rising crime rate, and not assimilating American values and behaviors. Sound familiar? Fear and anxiety shrouded the immigration of Eastern Europeans because they were thought to be bringing beliefs, religions, ideologies, and political persuasions inimical to the American way. Karen Brodkin, George Lipsitz, Matthew Fry Jacobson, David Rodiger, and others actually, have vividly described how racialized ethnic groups of Europe became white after World War II while May Nye and Ian Haney Lopez, and also amongst others, have described the complicated history of how the promulgation of immigration policy in the interpretation of immigration law produced complicated contradictions and created enduring constructs of race in America. 
Anthropology became a mature and respected discipline during these years, in part because it was the science of race and culture during the progressive eras, whose leaders used science to regulate laissez-faire markets and the liberty of people. During the late 19th century on, the government, pretty much for the first time, began systematically regulating and managing minimum wages and maximum hours, food and drugs, monopolies and foreign trade. Progressive era reformers also regulated and managed Native Americans on reservations and regulated and managed women's reproductive freedom through eugenics programs that mandated involuntary sterilization. Politics and the public were, politicians and the public were quick to use science to solve problems in society. Although generally not viewed as a progressive era reform, Jim Crow segregation and Negro disenfranchisement was an effective way that the government regulated and managed the way African Americans worked, conveyed, ate, slept, learned, and exercised their franchise. So I throw that in that bucket too, because that was again using science to manage a society problem. Immigration restriction and managing people in America's new empire in the Caribbean and South Pacific were part of these same regulatory efforts that form constitutive elements in an integrated projects of in the integrated projects of race making and nation making. Before World War I, immigration to the United States was not particularly regulated. Between 1880 and World War I, some 25 million immigrants entered the United States through permissive immigration policies that eschewed passports, visas, and green cards. It was not permissive for all. People from China were expressly excluded from the opportunity to migrate to America. In the 1890s, influential men like Theodore Roosevelt and Francis A. Walker, the superintendent of the 1890 and 1880 census, began to stoke fear of race suicide and fuel enthusiasm for eugenics by peddling the notion that Eastern European immigrants were destroying America. In an article in the Atlantic Monthly aptly titled Restriction of Immigration, Walker explained to his 1896 readers that, it's an extended quote, only a short time ago, <laughs> only a short time ago, this is Francis Walker, um, only a short time ago, immigrants from southern Italy, Hungary, Austria, and Russia together made up hardly more than 1% of our immigration. Today, the proportion has risen to something like 40% and threatens soon to become 50 or 60 or even more. These people have no history behind them which is of a nature to give encouragement. They have none of the inherited instincts and tendencies which made it comparatively easy to deal with the immigration of olden time. They are beaten men from beaten races, representing the worst failures in the struggles of existence. Centuries are against them as centuries were on the side of those who formerly came to us. <clears throat> Immigration created some of the most pressing social problems of the day, deplorable living condi and health conditions and health outcomes in urban slums, industrial class conflict and violence, and corrupt political machines. Despite nativist fear mongering, immigrants were consumers, cheap laborers, and latent voters. Powerful business and political interests lobbied Congress to keep the flow of immigrants coming. The debate over immigration was largely waged between social Darwinists like Walker, who believed it would take centuries for the Hungarians and Poles to catch up on the road of, to civilization, and proponents of Americanization, or swift assimilation, like Francis A. Keller, who was the chief architect of the Americanization and Settlement House movements. She implored that if we fail to see to it that 32 million persons in this country of foreign born or of foreign percentage, I like that, are Americans in language, in loyalty, in citizenship, and in manner of life, I firmly believe we shall have lost our one great opportunity to determine the destiny of this republic, to make it not an aggregation of peoples, but one nation united by common ideals against enemies without and within, 
The issue of the Americanization movement is the future of America, whether we shall survive as one nation or perish as a conglomeration of racial colonies. If we fail to see that Americans need Americanization in order to make available to America the best in the alien and make him something more than a pay envelope asset, we shall fail to achieve a united America. In 1903, immigration to the United States increased nearly, by nearly 150,000 to exceed 800,000 new people coming to the United States. Theodore, President Theodore Roosevelt told a joint session of the 58th U.S. Congress that, quote, we cannot have too much immigration of the right kind, and we should have none at all of the wrong kind. We need The need is to devise some system by which undesirable immigrants shall be kept out entirely, while desirable immigrants are properly distributed throughout the country. Congress agreed and set out to develop a fair and scientific system. Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge was adamant that the government needed to restrict the dusky and swarthy races steaming to our shores. This is Lodge. We are admitting annually an immigration which equals in numbers the population of a great city, wholly unsifted, in a great measure ignorant, in part Asiatic, and drawn largely from the lowest and most backward population of Europe. It now affects most grievously our electorate that have no sense of the value of that privilege and become tools of the worst and most dangerous political managers. It fills our labor market with the cheapest of the most objectionable labor of Eastern Europe and Asian minor. If anyone will take the trouble to study the statistics of our prisons, insane asylums, and almshouses, we will see by the percentages that an enormous direct burden it places on the states and upon taxpayers. Lodge was buoyed by sensationalist journalists, a strident and powerful immigration restriction league, and academics all calling for the restriction of Eastern European immigrants. Vermont Republican Senator William Dillingham was the chair of the Senate Committee on Immigration, and he headed Roosevelt's call and began proposing amendments to existing immigration laws. Dillingham was a respected progressive era senator who was considered a moderate on immigration. He favored head taxes, literacy tests, and rejecting women who were prostitutes, the feeble-minded, and the physically and mentally defective measures that did not single out a particular country or origin or religion. He favored providing incentives for families to immigrate. He proposed legislation along these lines in 1906, which passed the Senate. The House passed legislation that was more relaxed, but included a provision to establish a commission to study the problem of immigration and make recommendation for an alternative to the literacy test. Senator Dillingham chaired the conference committee charged with reconciling the legislation. President Roosevelt eventually signed two bills, the Naturalization Act of 1906 and the Immigration Act of 1907. Together, this legislation outlined new processes for naturalization and immigration. The laws included provisions for new standards for naturalization and established the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization as part of the Commerce Department aimed directly at restricting Japanese immigrants, or at that time they called them the, the, the immigrant contract laborers, the so-called coolie labor, they, they also called this the coolie labor law. It included a provision that rejected aliens whose labor was under contract. Finally, the law authorized a bipartisan commission to study different aspects of the immigration question with the hopes that science and systematic assessment could help mitigate and manage the throngs of tempest-tossed, huddled masses arriving on American shores. In addition to members of the House and Senate, which included both Dillingham and Lodge, President Roosevelt appointed Charles P. Neal from the Department of Labor, William Wheeler, the California Commission of Immigration, and Jeremiah Jinks, a professor of political economy from Cornell. The nine-member commission convened in April of 1907 and elected Dillingham chairman of the commission. It was Professor Jeremiah Jinks, however, who drove the capacious intellectual agenda. 
The commission began its work in 1907 and concluded in 1911. The report was encyclopedic in both breadth and scope and the most exhaustive study on immigration in American history. And it was actually one of the largest investigative surveys Congress has ever conducted, totaling 42, I mean, the thing is like, it's bigger than encyclopedia, totaling 42 book-length volumes. It was a multidisciplinary assessment of virtually every aspect of immigration that could be studied. This was quintessential progressive era science, zealous, thorough, and putatively objective. The bias against Asian and Eastern European immigrants is glaring. The belief in social Darwinian principles explicit. As Mike Ney so eloquently articulates, demographic data were to the, 19th, to the 20th century racist what craniotomic data had been to race scientists during the 19th century. Samuel Morton, Louis Agassiz, and the anthropologists of the so-called American school measured facial angles and cranial capacity. The statisticians of the Dillingham Commissions counted inmates in asylums and prisons. Both groups of scientists began with a priori categories and conclusions and conveniently confirmed a causal relationship between their data and racial groups. If the statisticians found that certain immigrants were less wealthy, healthy, and educated, the logic then followed that these immigrants had inferior bodies and brains that retarded their ability to adapt American customs and behaviors. The explicit panic was the fear that these immigrants would overwhelm the nation and pollute American blood and character. The commission reports comprised of countless tables of enumerations and full-blown monographs on everything from mining and manufacturing to birth rates and disease, from education attainments to patterns of criminality. As the commission began its work in earnest, the number of immigrants kept rising, topping a million a year. According to Senate historian Betty Coed, she is actually a historian at the Senate, Betty Coed, the commission was engaged in studied panic. There was a sense of losing control, but there is also, at the same time, this great confidence and hope that if we study the problems carefully and we apply all these wonderful new sciences, we have that we can solve the problem through policy making. The recommendation of the commission was far-reaching and vast. They included ensuring that immigrants could read and write, extending the Chinese Exclusion Act, and ensuring that Japanese and Korean immigration remain in check, and deporting any alien who committed a serious crime within five years or became a public charge within three. The commission also recommended creating a prohibition of East Indian laborers and excluding unskilled immigrant men without wives or families. Recommendation 8 included, quote, the limitation of the number of each race arriving each year to ascertain to a certain percentage of the average of that race arriving during a given period of years, which led to the quota system. The commission report and recommendation had wide-ranging impact in the years preceding and following World War I. It formed the basis of the 1917 Immigration Act that imposed a literacy test and banned immigration, except for the Philippines and some from Japan. The recommendation also buttressed sweeping, the Sweeping Immigration Act of 1924, known as the Johnson Reed Act, which used national origin quotas and eliminated Asian immigration. The law institutionalized and rationalized progressive era's technocrats' interpretation of anthropological categories of race to regulate and manage the racial composition and character of America. That impact of the law still resonates today. Although important modifications were made to the immigration and naturalization laws after World War II and again in 1965, the apparatus for maintaining restrictive policy was consolidated in the 1920s and remains today. We retain the bureaucratic state regime based on border control, numerical quotas, removal of illegal aliens, and a visa system that determines who can live, work, and go to school in the United States. Importantly, decisions regarding visas move from ports to consulates from the Department of Commerce to the State Department. 
The copious research and writing that went into the 42 volumes was combined compiled by leading scientists of the day, including an important volume on immigrant growth written by Franz Boas. The first two volumes consisted of an 800-page abstract with recommendations and conclusions. <laughs> Although probably drafted by Jeremiah Jinks, Senate document number 747 was simply presented by Mr. Dillingham to the 61st First Congress, as if he wrote all 42 volumes. Um, the, two, the two volume introduction and abstract, Dillingham explicitly dis in that he dis 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 explicitly discussed what he sought to fix. After wax waxing nostalgic about the oh, quote, old immigration that quote, was a movement of settlers who came from the most progressive sections of Europe for the purpose of making themselves homes in the new world. He explained that the commission was focused on the new immigration that, quote, was a class far less intelligent than the old, with almost a third being illiterate. Continue the quote, racially they are, for the most part, essentially unlike the British, German, and other peoples who came to during the prior, prior to 1880. Distinguishing race from country of origin was a top priority of Dillingham and his commission because they believed it provided a much more nuanced and accurate description of the people coming to America. The practice, however, simply supported and contributed to a nation-building project based on eugenic principles. Although much of the collective panic focused on immigrants' bad customs and behaviors, the underlying theory that many of the restrictionists believed was that those customs and behaviors were the result of bad brains and bodies. Dillingham was, Dillingham was quite explicit for the case of immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, the country of birth as, as a usual thing also fairly established the racial status. With the development of immigration movement from Eastern and Southern Europe, however, data based on knowledge of the country of birth alone indicated practically nothing of the racial status of persons um, from such country. Dillingham explained that seven distinct races come from Russia, including large numbers of Teutonic, Slavic, Semitic, and even Mongolian races. Following the 1899 practice of the Bureau of Immigration and not the Census Bureau, the Commission classified immigrants by races or peoples, opposed to country of origin or other language spoken. The Commission, he explained, uses the term race in a broad sense, the distinction being largely a matter of language and geography, rather than color or physical characteristics, such as determines the various more restricted racial classifications and use, the most common of which divides mankind in only five races. For practical or statistical <coughs> purposes, such classification is obviously without value and is rarely employed. So progressive era scientists, they wanted precision. The value, as Jenks and Dillingham saw it, was in racializing whites by sorting them into races, stocks, and people. Consistent categories of races across volumes and tables was an important part of the commission's scientific and rigorous work. Not all races and people, however, agreed with their categories, and Dillingham reports this. Dillingham reported, the objection to the racial classification adopted by the commission was specifically directed against the use of the word Hebrew or Jewish to designate a race. The objection was voiced by several prominent Hebrews who contended that the Jews are not a distinct race in an ethnological sense. While appreciating the motive which actuated the protest against the designation of Hebrews as a race, the commission is convinced that such usage is entirely justified. So he just moves right on, entirely justified. Dillingham and Jenks allocated considerable space in the introductory volumes to present an abridged version of the most, one of the most influential volumes. Volume 5, Senate document number 662. Anyone remember where that came up? Anyone who was listening at the very beginning? Mohan Singh, that was the one thing he cited, and it's called Volume 5, Dictionary of Races and People. They framed the importance of the volume. 
Quote, early in the commission's investigations among the newer immigrants, it became apparent that the true racial status of many of them was imperfectly understood, even in the communities where they were most numerous. This work, which was prepared by Dr. Daniel Folkmore, um, this work was prepared by Folkmore. No work of this nature has before been published in the English language, although related works have been printed in French, German, and other languages. The present work, moreover, differs essentially from previous publications of the same nature, in that it was written primarily with reference to the subject of immigration and for the convenience of students of that subject, rather than the ethnologist. It was neither the plan of the commission nor the purpose of the author to attempt an original discussion of anthropology or ethnology, but rather to bring together from the most reliable sources such existing data as it was believed would be useful in promoting a better understanding of the many different racial elements that were being added to the population of the United States through immigration. The author provided a brief description of Blumenbach's familiar white, black, brown, yellow, and red races, but argued that scheme was not practical to identify patterns of immigration in capturing the diversity of Eastern European Europe. The progressive era scientists desired more specificity, more granularity in their statistics. Quote, the primary classification of mankind into five grand divisions may be made upon upon some grounds, while the subdivisions of these multi subdivisions of these into multitude of smaller races or peoples are made largely on linguistic grounds. So he says Blumenbach is good for the first cut, but we're going to use language to go down in more granularity. Dillingham and Jinx relied on folklore to make the strategic decision that the commission would use language as a proxy for race, indeed the arbiter for the races of Europe. Folkmore eschewed head shape and stature that was, quote, insist upon the able works of William Ripley and Joseph Denker. The express reason was sheer pragmatism. Here's the quote. The immigrant inspector or enumerator in the field may easily ascertain the mother tongue of an individual, but he has neither the time nor the training to determine whether such an individual is doliocephalic or brachiocephalic in type. Instead, relying, instead of relying on either Ripley or Denkier, Folkmore turned to, quote, the American authority Brinton as the most reliable narrator of race for the person of the commission's work. Daniel Forkmore was a well-known anthropologist and statistician who studied at Harvard, Clark, Chicago, Paris, and Berlin. A founding member of the AAA, he was also the fifth American to receive the certificate Ecole d'Anthropologie from the University of Paris in 1889. He also served a term as president of Western Michigan College. He began government service in 1903 as lieutenant governor of the Philippine of the Philippine Civil Service, and then became, quote, special agent of the Immigration Commission and compiled the influential dictionary. Folkmore was an active member of the AAA and the American Anthropological Society of Washington, and he often presented papers with Elish Herzwischka and Roland Dixon and a number of the sort of early physical anthropologists. Folkmore was quite explicit that Daniel G. Britton provided the racial schema for the dictionary. The dictionary provided the organizational frame for the commission's work, which provided the institutional, scientific, and intellectual rationale for the quota scheme in the 1924 Johnson-Reed Immigration Act. This might be Brenton's greatest legacy. In a bibliography, Folkmore begins with a section called Ethnology and Anthropology and explains, quote, the anthropologist who has been chiefly followed in this classification adopted is the American Brenton. And he cites Brenton's Races and Peoples, Anthropology and Ethnology, and I should say 1890, this is 1911, Anthropology and Ethnology, 1886, The American Race, 1891. He added, work, he added that works by Augustus Keene has generally supplemented Brenton, but the latter is not quite up to date. For folklore, Folkmar, Jenks, Dillingham, and the rest of the commission, Brenton was a very reliable narrator, particularly the way he organized 
and classified races and people. Dillingham himself was so impressed by the dictionary and the way Folkmore used Brenton to classify the races, he singled out that volume and boasted on the Senate floor that, quote, the commission has even prepared a dictionary of races, which every senator will be very glad to have in his library. On the one hand, the commission could not use country of origin because it could not capture the diversity of peoples in Russia or Turkey. Moreover, they could not simply use language because they thought it was important to distinguish Bohemians from Moravians, Flemish from Walloons. Race became the most efficient way to delineate difference. The commission formally used terms, races or peoples, as the operative or official way of organizing and classifying what they might, what we might call ethno-linguistic groups. However, in the analysis, writing, and description of immigrant populations, the commissioners and their agents rarely deployed the, uh, routinely deployed the terms race and races, and rarely, if other peoples, or peoples. And the example here, as you heard, Dillingham going to the Senate floor saying, "We got a dictionary of races." So he drops peoples, and then you see this time and time again. Folkmore explained that his classificatory team was approximately correct regarding the status of immigrant races, and he recognized that, quote, mistakes are inevitable in the work of this nature. He was particularly skeptical of using somat somatology alone to organize people. He pointedly predicted that an acceptable classification of peoples will be based in the future upon continuity of descent among the members of race or stock, whether such genetic relationship be established by so much logical difference, sociological or historical evidence, or all combined. So he sort of the work of Brenton that Folkmore employed consistently was races and peoples. In fact, he produced his classificatory scheme virtually verbatim in the dictionary. And in 1886, Daniel Brenton received, okay, and I'm gonna show you. In 1886, Daniel Brenton received the first uh, appointment as a professor of anthropology at an American museum, and it was actually here at Pitt, where he focused on indigenous languages and folklore. Brenton was a prolific writer, critic, and scholar of Native American literature, philology, and archaeology. Ambitious and eager to make anthropology a professional discipline with impact, he abandoned his work on indigenous languages and philology to focus on the hot topic, race. Races and Peoples was published in 1890, and it was literally how-to guide to classifying and ranking the races. To classify and rank races, Britain was distinctive because he used what he called physical elements of ethnography, which included cranial capacity, facial angle, color, muscle stature, um, but also psychological elements to include social instincts, arts of life, I don't know what these are called, but mi migratory instincts, but importantly, language. Brenton was only committed to, was not only committed to classifying the races, he ranked order them. And he was pretty explicit that, quote, the European or the white stands at his head, the African or the Negro at its foot. Throughout the book, Brenton routinely forged cliche and negative stereotypes as scientific fact. For example, he confidently explained the physical type of the Jew is well known and unmistakable. Wavy hair, darker blonde, full beard, eyes soft, nose prominent, rather heavy, skull medium to long. Um, so is his uh, mental traits are very familiar. Apply and supple disposition. This is a full quote in the commas. I'm, there's nothing taken out. A distaste for physical labor or the toil of the pioneer or soldier. Deficiency in personal courage, subtlety in monetary transactions, industrial uh, industry and industrial pursuits, strong devotion to family. This is the Jew as we know him in the tussle of our modern life, suspected and disliked but wielding an influence out of proportion to the numerical strength of his people. End of quote. But then he goes on and talks about language. Racial classification for Brenton was a confident but a little crazy mix of measuring and describing brains and bodies, as well as customs and behavior, often relying on the threadbare stereotypes as scientific fact. 
To distinguish North Africans from Sub-Saharan Africans, Brenton reminded his readers, the true Negroes are passionate and fond of music, singing, and dancing. Brenton was a serious scholar and a seasoned philologist and a careful reader. He carefully cited sources and was committed to demonstrating that language was an important, important part of classifying people. He convincingly demonstrated that the structure of grammar and the large language family was, quote, almost deserves to be called a racial trait. I'm going to stop there and walk you through the last little bit. And all I really have to point to is right here. So based on Britain's philology, which was right, Hindus are Indo-European. He followed the Sanskrit. He did his work on migration. He called it as he sees it. And, and you got Caucasian. And this was dictionary races. And this is, as you see, C.F. Britain. This is his categories here. And this was the thing that caused everybody problems because remember, go to this beginning, our, our good, uh, right, eminent grand commander of the Knights Templar, when he made that decision to give Mohan Singh citizenship, he went to the, to the scientist of the day, he cites one citation, it was this, this was Dillian Commission, right? I mean, this is America's best science. And they're, they're white, they're Caucasian. Now, what happens is uh, Bagatson then comes up next and goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, I don't care what anthropologists say. This guy's not white. Period. And that was the rationale. So at that point, anthropology was an unreliable narrator because they just couldn't fathom that a Caucasian could be white. I mean, so it was like, it's not common sense. So we're going to go on common sense, not science. And the one before that, of course, was, was the Ozawa case. And he was claiming he was white, but he was Japanese. So he was arguing the skin color. I'm just as white as many Spanish people, right? And then they, they said, no, the anthropologists don't say, they say you're not white because you're not Caucasian. <laughs> and then the next year, and so it's just back and forth and back and forth. And, but it doesn't end there. It, up until even a few years after this, Boaz gets called to, this, um, to, the, um, to the stand to testify that Armenians are white. Now, this guy looked white. And so then, and he said, well, Boaz says he's white. He's got to be white. But he looked white. And, he, and it all became part of the Turks. I mean, it was this whole thing that they were against the Turks and, and they were if they were white. They were probably with the Ottoman Empire. Anyway, the actually the people of rhetoric take that case up to, to a whole different level about um, discrimination. But Boaz is on the stand saying this is white, and he become he gets citizenship based on Boaz's testimony. So this is all over the map until World War II, when everyone becomes white, except the people down here <laughs> that you know have no ethnic or no ethnicity. Where's the I love American? You're not Negro. This is it. These are like no East African, you know, a Khan, Igbo, Yoruba. Um, and so these people that have the just district, you know, the ethnicities become white, but not the other people outside of these categories. They just become an Asian world. Anyway, you can see I'm not quite done. But I spent the time anyway. Hopefully <laughs> this was instructive. I know there was a lot of history and a lot of cases and laws, but you can see where I was coming at the, at the beginning, the framing of those two cases. But this is super significant. And you go through this, and Brenton is there all over the place. And it's because he had this language component that it made it more sophisticated, but then it ends up sort of tripping um, some of the, well, the Supreme Court ends up ignoring it, but for some of the district courts we're really relying on. So we're looking at the limits of anthropology. Thank you very much. about 15 minutes for Q&A, if you're at that point, so um, we welcome questions. Yes. So at one time, you mentioned the religion was in reference to the Hebrews, about how Jewish people did not constitute, or did constitute race in the same way that linguistic and 
big margin did. And religion seems to be the central part of arguments against immigration now. Whether or not someone is Christian or has Christian values, in this case it's homophobia, but can you explain why or why not religion is not a part of these? Well, I, I think religion was behind much of it. I mean, Catholicism was, people were afraid of it. And the nativist movement, the know-nothings, but it gets, I, you know, it, it, was, it was part of it. I mean, I, 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 I think the real reason was it was different, it was different religions, um, political persuasions, different sort of modes and customs, and that, and I think one of the other important things was, you know, either willingness or not willingness to assimilate. Because some of the people are like, I'm, I'm Hindi, I'm not trying to become Christian, I'm, um, I'm not trying to assimilate very much, I'm Orthodox, I'm not trying to, so there was some fear of that. So I think it was one of many components. But again, there's this interesting way that I think they honestly believe this was the most efficient, way of doing things was just to rely on race because it did the work of so many other things, like keeping Christians um, and Protestants, I should say, because they were trying to, Catholics were suspect as well, sort of, um, sort of together. It, yeah, it's, it's a good one. At that time in the literature, that was one of many things that they were afraid of, but it was a primary one. Particularly, one of the reasons they said, I said, come up with a better thing than a literacy test, is because Jews could be. Right? So they wanted a little bit more. <laughs> uh, something a little, yeah, to keep the right and the wrong out. And that was, I think, to me, one of the more subtle um, acknowledgments that they were trying to actually supposed to keep Eastern European Jews out. The Western, the Germans were okay. It's a really interesting distinction. Um, sadly, history repeats itself over and over again in many ways. Um, it, I do, you know, France and uh, French West Indies and, and the history of migration and immigration from Korea, from, from the Caribbean. Um, and this reminds me of all the rhetoric around the topic in the last month. About 800 years on assimilation, which also contributes to this whole narrative at the same time. If you look at um, different literatures on who's the, who can assimilate, who doesn't, and there's a whole compendium of literature on the topic of assimilation. And it, to me, dovetails and provides another fleshing out of this point. If you look at the history of what you know? What 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 populations? What what groups who can and cannot assimilate? An example in the French West Indies was the, the people, in, and actually probably from uh, the British and English-speaking Caribbean as well, going into the United States, America, and um, Western Europe, um, because there were people of color, even if they were were of the right. Um, but that. Literature is all couched under into the topic of assimilation. And I'm sure this is all a, couched under the topic of right, assimilation. And, and there, you know, there's a lot of But it's not the assimilation of individuals. Like in some respect, you think, well, if that person can assimilate, it's like mass group. This whole this is a crazy book. If you ever are interested, it's all <laughs> online. You can thumb through it. It's literally a dictionary. You know, A for Aryans, and they have a little section about that, and B for Bedouins, they have a little section about that. But throughout everyone, it sort of discusses, you know, how they assimilate, are they available to assimilate, and why don't they assimilate, or something. So shot through the entire dictionary hinges on this particular um, idea of are they assimilable or not. Right. And religion comes up again and again as well. So you can sort of see through the anxiety. What that doesn't happen here, thank goodness or not, thank goodness, they take a lot of Brenton's worst sort of stereotypes and the cra crazy sort of conjecture he has in the 1890s, and they kind of, they do scrub it. So it's not as egregious as some of his um, descriptions. And they don't rely on half of Brenton's, um, which was the physical 
uh, categorization. They really kind of go on language. But this is what Boaz was up against. This is them force feed race, language, culture, all together to make individual races. And it was really hegemonic. And then to pull that out of both popular culture and public policy was a Herculean thing. So if there's actually, you know, if there's an interesting way of looking at this, this sets up that how difficult it was to dismantle it because it's baked into American public policy. I don't know who, we'll go start with that. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Amber Henry. I'm here in cultural anthropology. So going off of what you just said about these ideas being baked into American policy, I'm curious at what point for you the United States becomes a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multiracial society. And if in your vision it ever has, or whether it's more of what Sarah often talks about and on being included, where it's really just like an idea of diversity that's not ever fully achieved. I mean, it clearly always has. Now, I guess from my perspective, what is federal law? <laughs> and at that time, they were trying to manage sort of diversity in sort of important ways. Again, there was a lot of, in the 1920s, there was still a lot of pressure to bring immigrants in, whether they assimilated or not, because they were cheap labor and they, you know, were laden voters. So there was a tension here, even among the Democrats and, and the Republicans. Um, the other thing is once they did turn speaking <coughs> off, the black migration happened because someone had to work in those factories, and that actually, that's why there's a lot of contingencies here that once immigration started being restricted, then African migration from the South became even quicker. And, um, so I don't know about in terms of when it was a, a multicultural, I'd say it was always, and there's been different supporting of that um, in supporting multicultural differences and assimilation in different periods that the federal government has either supported or tried to eliminate. Thank you for coming. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I wanted to sort of ask you about something that I think you do amazingly well, which is sort of bridge anthropology and history and use documents, archive, and field in a sort of way that takes the balances of time and space and the interpretation of culture and history and puts them together. In, and I wanted to just ask you about like your methodological and epistemological sort of framework for doing so because they're such huge discipline. Well, I'm going to ask you to write the blurb for my next book. <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> Part of that was inspired from anthro history. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, that's a great question. It seems to come naturally to me in so many ways. It's sort of the, it's the downside of interdisciplinarity, is that you never know much of anything about what you're talking about. You just have to have a lot of confidence, hope you have some good friends. Um, but to give you a point, I mean, in the last book, I got two reviews, right? One reviewer says, oh, this African-American stuff, we all know this, this is so routine, it's been written about, historians do a better job than Lee Baker. But this Native American stuff, my goodness, this is all new, I can't believe the, the connection he makes and all this sort of stuff. And so we should publish it. We'll try to you know, make it more exciting or do something new in African American history. Now, we send it to a Native American person. This Native American stuff's all old, it's been gone through all the time. But this African American stuff, that's all new. And, let's make, and the way he makes the connections, and so what kind of what do you do with that? And Kenny Westerner kind of is like, well, I guess this is internet. Jeff and I share the same editor. Um, and it is sort of this way of synthesizing, synthesizing African American studies, now immigration history, which is new to me, and it's big. It's a lot bigger than Native American, even African American history. But then driving the, anth the anthropological threads and sewing them through, and just trying to tell the story. And it's fun doing the research, and I'm not a historian, and, but I like, his, the his, I like history, and I like, you know what it is, I like the historical record. 
So in some respects, I look at the historical record as evidence, as my data, and I don't know if I'm doing the right historiography. I'm just having fun with it, trying to make connections and tell the story. So, but my hook is the anthropology. A lot of people will talk about this, but no one pulls together the anthropology. When anthropologists do history, they do disciplinary histories. And it makes me so frustrating when like, you don't know who they were colonizing at the time when they were you're doing like they go through this and this and without the context. So that's kind of my approach and um, it is, and I thank goodness I have an audience because people want to know about the history of anthropology. And so thanks for asking, but that, I don't know if that answers it. No. Thank you. I try to bring them all together. Yes. Um, thank you. I found so much of this really fascinating and on that point just I mean, one that's really nice, I'm glad you asked, and nice to hear about kind of your experience with it. But also really, so much of the quotes were really striking, the things they were sharing. And I just wanted to kind of mirror back a couple and ask your thoughts on it, just a couple things that struck me. And I'm just wondering if these connect, from what you've been researching, if these connect in some way, or they just struck. But um, was struck earlier, you were talking about um, the ways people were, they were categorizing certain people as having no history behind them, or like the centuries were against them. Um, and then this detail too of trying to leave out men without families. So I was kind of curious too, like why, what else was going on? Why people were thinking too? We want to come in here and have families. What sort of imaginings were there? And then the third point you were talking too about um, sort of remaking American nation and how they're thinking of destiny in this kind of thing. And so I was wondering, was there something? Were these lawmakers partly concerned with thinking about um, some sort of temporal thing of this like future of America? And is there some link, or is it just kind of random of on the last chart people who they leave out all these details? They, there's no ethnicity, or sort of this comments of there's there's no history, or there's no sort of people that are left behind by the centuries and some imagination of a American. Um, That's a good. It might be something like that. that. But I think there was, everyone was committed to progress, okay? And, and there was a pretty <coughs> clear, there was not many people questioned um, social Darwinism. So when they, they were centuries behind, they were literally, like it would take them two centuries for evolution, it's pretty quick, right? <laughs> um, that, to catch up. Um, and so why ha bring people that are two centuries behind? Let's just keep the Germans that were pretty much with us anyway. So that was the evolution. It was literally, he thought, it would take 200 years before they were able to be at the same plane of civilization as the Norwegians or whatever. What they thought about the Negroes, oh, that like 500 centuries, I don't know. But um, it is interesting how they split these racial discussions. There's a little overlap, but not a lot, even in the anthropologists that are doing stuff. Because they were using the same anthropology to talk about at the same time to um, justify desegregation, I mean, justify segregation in Jim Crow. Uh -huh. Now, the family thing was this. They said, when these single men come together, they're really going to just make money to go back home. They all live together. They don't even want to assimilate because they're just saving money to go back home. And they have squalid conditions and would then get uh, sort of the flu or whooping cough or some of these diseases and then spread them. And so that was one of the reasons. If you have a family, you're here for a long term. But it is all about progress and investing and growing a nation. I mean, this is really, I mean, it's more than I thought before that this nation building project and race nation making project was really sutured in an interesting way where both immigration and this is the time we're in Samoa right, for the first time. Hawaii, Cuba, Philippines, and the same um, sort of rhetoric almost about hygiene and progress and Christian civilization is bolstering all this uplift talk, which goes to some sort of better nation in the future. Maybe um, one. Okay, you call. Who am I called on? Who I should have. Uh, well, maybe Kiel, and then perhaps you could say your question, and he can. Um, thanks for the talk. Was splendid, and I had a question. That, um, if you could say a little bit more about the connection between America and West science and immigration policy, in the context that of um, other nations and their colonial immigration policy. Right? I'm thinking there were moments in the talk 
where you talked about coolies, for instance, these categories of labouring classes that seem to reference and thinking of like British colonisation oh, yeah. um, and other forms of, of categorising people and their workability for the making of new nation. Was there any language in the literature you're reading about that? So, we're the, you know, the interesting, I never thought of this before. The language wasn't... President Roosevelt, in particular, and other executive branch people used American immigration policy as diplomacy, particularly Mexico. So Mexico, because and this I didn't put it in there, and it's a long, it's an interesting story. Because of the Treaty of Hidalgo, Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico were white, and they could always get citizenship. They would just tr tr treaty. Now people were like, "Did we do the right thing?" It's such a question. <laughs> citizens of California and Texas, but then people kept coming in, those borders were pretty porous, and it wasn't after the, uh, 1917 that it became illegal, because the head taps and stuff, it's like expensive to keep going back and forth. But they also wanted to keep good relationships with Mexico, so they kept kind of this interesting, same thing with Japan, leading up to World War II, they had these gentlemen's agreements, and with other things, and so they used immigration policy and they were worried about India as well. They used immigration policy as diplomacy in a way I had never thought, you know. And so there was these conversations, particularly in the, um, also with the colonies in the Caribbean to keep people coming. And that's where you actually get some of these token 100 people. When the quotas come in, it's not every country. There's real strategic countries we want to keep relationships with, where they'll be, well, we can handle 100 from X, Y, or Z. Yeah, so I don't know, and maybe my research just didn't leave me, but that was where internationalism became. It was very explicitly used to keep relationships good with Japan, keep relationships good with Mexico, and some of these other countries. Uh, okay, oh. um, just just really quickly, okay, because we're already over time for the rest of the seminar. Or, um, I, the idea of assimilation, I think, is extremely critical because the, what are we talking about when you say assimilation is convergence uh, and convergence of values. So the question becomes, what are the American values? And one can look at uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness as a, a, a core American right. value. Uh, so the question there is, you know, uh, are we clear on what those values are? Because there is a question even now that uh, the Federal Reserve uh, Bank is looking for a new framework because they, what they found was in their meeting, this is in the last month or so, that uh, uh, whatever they intended to do uh, became opposite of what they, effect, they expected it to be. So that was an example of what you had said about intending to do the right thing yeah. and uh, having, uh, uh, having the opposite effect. So here's a question for you. Uh, if we consider liberty and therefore democracy and free market system as Central American value, then uh, uh, there's a question here because freedom cannot exist without a free society. And, but uh, uh, society needs caring for the other. But if you're free, why should you care for the other? So how do you have a free society? And therefore, how can you have conversion for life? That's, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, but th this is where there's some of uh, the fundamental American ironies and the tension between freedom and liberty and justice. <laughs> Right? Because justice is about the government doing something. Either meeting out, social justice, maybe. But liberty is allowing you to do whatever you want. And to me, this is where that tension about maximum hours, minimum wage, should we sterilize women, should we keep Negroes in? I mean, it's, it's all about restricting liberties. Now, liberty when we restrict it for maximum, minimum wage sounds okay. Food and drug, I think we can all get behind that. But to what? Extent is impinging when you are managing restrictions, managing some of these other things. So there's always been, but people do it in the name of justice, health justice. There's always, I think, I think that, I think that's one of those things that makes America is this kind of crazy tension between liberty, freedom, and justice. But the other thing too is these people were doing, trying to do the right thing. They lived in a, in a, they lived in a social Darwinian paradigm. So it's hard to say, oh, they should have known. Actually, 
Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, if you read them carefully, they kind of live in the same paradigm. They were pushing up against it, but until they had the tools to say otherwise, it was a sort of thing. Now, this is where there's some new research that came out that says, oh, they, they shouldn't really be blaming all the racism in. That may be true. There are probably good technocrats who are just doing their job. And at the end of the day, this is where I'm going to, at the conclusion, use Eduardo Boyan Silva's work, where you can actually have racism and articulate racism without racists. I think, now, Lodge racist, you know, uh, Jigs, you know, Dillingham, ah. Um, <laughs> But they were kind of good technocrats trying to solve problems with, you know, in society. But they still are, are, I mean, that's kind of like saying, well, you know, they've been carrying Buck's fallopian tubes. They were doing that in the name of, um, you know, the right thing, but that's not sexist. Right? It's, you know, you can still be racist without, you can articulate racism without being explicitly racist. And I think that's a lot that was going on here. It gets picked up after the quota stuff, and it becomes more explicitly racist up until 19, um, World War II, and then things split. After they see Hitler, like they see what this looks like when it really becomes institutionalized. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.